Amen. Guys, um, if you will, go ahead and take out your worship, guys. We're going to be looking uh, at the reality of what they call, and in, in seminary they call the incarnation. Basically, that means that this, this, this God took on human flesh. And I know that if you're a Christian, when I talk about God taking on flesh, and I talk about the incarnation, you know, that you can, well, I, I know this. I've, I've heard this. I've experienced this. I want you to know that throughout the, the annals of history, this, this whole concept was a completely unique, ridiculous, utterly unheard of thing. Because if you look at the ancient gods, and I'm talking about, you know, some of you in school, you've studied them, you know, the Greek gods and the Roman gods and the ancient gods. The gods, they were not here with us. The gods, they were above us. They were beyond us. They were powerful and they were great. And never, ever, ever in any story throughout history would a god dare give up godhood so that he or she could truly be with us. And yet that's what we celebrate at Christmas time. The reality, the very present reality that not only did Jesus die for us, but that he was willing to leave heaven to live with us. Um, I, 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 it's hard for me really to imagine that. Um, and I, I have four children of my own, and it's, it's a blessing to have them. And I, I don't know, how many of you guys this morning, how many of you proud parents have children? Raise your hand if you have children. Okay, a, a lot of you guys. There was actually more in the first service, but that's not surprising. Because if you have children, you might as well come early because you're already up early. Can I get an amen from the parents? Um, but those of you who have kids, I don't know if, any, if you ever do this, but I find myself every once in a while looking at my kids and kind of wondering, like, what are they going to be one day? Um, I have four. My oldest is a little girl named Gabby. She's nine. And she's really beautiful, and she's really shy, and she's really artistic. And, and I look at her now, little nine-year-old Gabby, and I'm like, what is she going to be like at 19? And what's she going to be like at 39? What's she going to be like at 69? You just imagine, God, what do you have for her life? What is she going to do? What is she going to be when she gets older? And my, my son, I have a six-year-old son named Nathaniel, who very sadly, he is the spitting image of me. And I'm so sorry in every sense of the word that is true, but he, he is so much like me. And I look at him and I'm like, you know, you're six now. What's it going to be like at 16? What's it going to be like at 36? What's it going to be like at 66, you know, for, for him? Who is he going to be? What is he going to do with his life? And, and the twins... Guys, I mean, you know, they still are eating dog food, by the way. That's what, that's what I have to say about the twins. If you don't know what I'm talking about, my twins, they'll say no to goldfish and yes to dog food. It's really weird. Pray for them. They're 18 months old, and they're, they're beautiful. But just imagine, you know, who are they going to be? What are they going to accomplish? How are they going to impact the world? And as I'm considering that now at Christmas time, I mean, just imagine Mary. Imagine Mary, this, this, this young woman visited by an angel who, who says, you're going to get pregnant by God. And the son that you're going to bear is going to change the world forever. And I guess, you know, what, what did she imagine for Jesus? I, did, did she imagine him being the great ruling king? Because let's just be real. The Jewish people believed the Messiah was going to be kind of a new King David. That he was going to come in. He was going to be strong and powerful and mighty and great. Or maybe, maybe if she was spiritual, she thought, oh, he's going to be the new high priest. And she could imagine her son one day sitting at the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. She probably did not imagine that her little baby was going to bleed and die a traitor's death on our behalf. And yet, that's exactly the plan that heaven constructed for our salvation. When, when, when God looked down at our sin and our shame, he said, you know what? I can't lead them through the temple to follow me rightly. I can't make a government perfect enough that they will obey the rules and know me truly. The only way I can be with them is if I take their pain and their shame and their sin on me. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas. Can I get an amen to that? That's, that's the whole point of Christmas. You can't rightly celebrate Christmas and the, and, 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 the, and the newborn Christ without remembering the cross and who he became when he grew up. Isaiah 7.14 is going to be kind of our key scripture for, for the next two weeks. I'm really excited about uh, celebrating Christmas Eve with you guys. That's going to be kind of a unique message. But for this week in the 17th, we're going to be looking kind of at this incarnation. Isaiah 7.14 says this. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son. And you will call him what, Ignite Church? Emmanuel. And if you didn't know what Emmanuel meant before you came, we've already sang enough songs about it that you probably know what it means. It means God with us. And again, that, 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 that's a revelatory statement that God would be with us. That there was, a, in a very literal, real sense, there was this moment where all of a sudden Jesus, full of glory and power and resurrection, he was God, y'all. The angels adored him. All the strength and might of the universe was at his fingertips. There was a moment where he, he somehow ceased to be there and he was here with us. 
Imagine waking up to what Jesus saw on his, his birth. Imagine that moment. You know, when, when part of the, the Christmas tradition, of course, is having the, you know, the, the scenes of the manger. And I don't know if you ever, if you grew up like me in the Baptist church, we always did these little Christmas cantatas and Christmas plays. And we do a good job of making the manger look good. You know what I'm saying? We have our cute, cutest kids up there on stage, and, you know, the, the hay is just so, and, and the animals, they don't smell because they're fake and they're made out of plush, you know, and they look, they look great. And we, we make it look so magical to be there in that moment, but let's just be real. Have you ever been to a barn? They don't smell very good. Have you ever been surrounded by, 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 by domesticated animals? They're not that cute. Could you imagine leaving heaven and waking up and you're inside a feeding trough? It's kind of gross. Jesus, his, his first tactile experiences probably were, were animal spit. And, yeah. <laughs> and the smell, the, the first smell he probably smelled is not a good smell. I'm not going to say that word again. Get me, but like, like, he left heaven and woke up to that. This God that carved out the, the Grand Canyon with his hands and flown the stars in the sky, all of a sudden, could you imagine just being Jesus and holding up your little baby hands? They're amazing. You know, like, could you like the, the humility and humbleness of that? This God that could do anything he wanted to do, anytime he wanted to do it, all of a sudden someone is having to wipe and clean up his diapers. That's what we celebrate when we celebrate Emmanuel God with us. Because if I was Jesus, I would have done it a different way. Hey, I'm not saying I wouldn't come for you, but I wouldn't come in the manger. I'd come like the man of steel. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, bulletproof and able to fly. And yes, the heat vision's pretty cool too. Like, like if I was God and I wanted to come and be a savior, I, I'd be comfortable being that kind of a savior. How many? Amen. But now this this rejected and despised and poor and broken and unknown savior, he humbled himself so that he could be with. Uh, Emmanuel means God with us. I don't know how many of you have ever had a time of weakness or brokenness. Some of you have, have gone through true times of physical weakness and brokenness. I, I've been really blessed. I'm, I'm still pretty young. I'm 37, although every year that, that number's going up, up, up. Eventually, I'm going to stop saying that about myself. I don't know when that is. Uh, Y'all can help me with that maybe. Somebody send me an email. Let me know. Is, thir is 37 still young? Yes? No? I hear equal measure, yes and no. Okay, well, that's all right. Um, to my kids, I know that I'm very, very old and getting there more and more every day. Um, but I've been blessed. I'm, I'm still physically able to do most of the things I want to do when I want to do it. The only time in my life that I can really remember having a hard time doing simple things was when I was in college. I've told you the story about how I went snowboarding with my brother and dislocated my shoulder. I'm not going to tell that story again. Basically, I was on a snowboard. I was jumping up a ramp. I had no business doing it. I'm not that good of a snowboarder. I fell on my arm instead of the board, and basically my shoulder, this part here, ended up down here. And it was very severe dislocation and, and stretching of tendons and all kinds of stuff. And in the past, when I've hurt my arms, I've been lucky. I've always hurt my left arm, and I'm right-handed. Well, this time I fell on my right arm, and all of a sudden, everything that I've been trying, I was trying to do was very, very hard. Just, just for fun, tonight, try brushing your teeth with your left hand. It is really, really, really hard to do that. I mean, every, everything was hard and, and awkward, you know, brushing your teeth and, and eating. Like, eating cereal is like, oh, you know, like, everything was very hard. And, and when, I, when I did this, it was, of course, like a week before final exams. I know that many of you who are students, you, you, you know that pain of filling up those blue books and doing all that stuff. And like, I had to write left-handed. I looked like I was in kindergarten again. Like, no joke. It was terrible. My professor was like, what? Yeah, yeah. Um, it was very hard being weak. That kind of weakness, we can't even imagine what Christ gave up to be with us. And he did it because he loves you. And he did it because he loves me. And then on this Sunday where we kind of brought a gift to him, I want to remind us, we do not give just because we're supposed to. We give because we've been given to and the greatest gift in all of human history, you can't put it under a tree, you can't wrap it in wrapping, you can't make it pretty with the bow. The greatest gift in human history is the gift that Jesus gave us in himself. And he did that for our salvation. Today, we're going to look at some specific things that Emmanuel means to us. If you want to take notes, we're, we're going to that. God with us. Number one, it means Emmanuel came to serve mankind. Why did God come to us? He came to serve us. He came to bless us. He came to care for us. And I want you to understand this, especially if you're visiting today. We serve and know a God that is not a needy God. He is a God that provides for our needs. He is a God that is there with us, and he came to serve us. And there's no better passage to express this 
that in Old Testament passage, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, this was written several hundred years before Jesus was born, but it was describing the Messiah. And it's real interesting, when you look at the description of this Messiah, he was not going to be a, 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 a Messiah that was served. He was going to be a Messiah that served others. And this is Isaiah 9, 6. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. I love that passage. That passage, it gets so succinctly and powerfully describes it. Hey, this God came because people are needy. If you don't think you're needy, either you're lying to yourself or you're not a human. Because we're all broken. We're all hurting. And no matter how much we try to fill our life up with the things of this world, without God in our life, we're empty. God saw our need and came to meet and fulfill and serve our needs. And I just want to kind of get into the scripture a little bit deeper with you. I hope that's okay. When you just kind of look at that part I underlined, there was a couple of names that this, this, this Messiah was going to be given. And the first one is Wonderful Counselor. One of the most fun things I get to do every week other than preach, I love doing this with you guys, you know, like today. But during the week, a lot of how I spend my time is I counsel with people. Um, I have a background in psychology. That's what I studied in school. And I love sitting down across the road with people and hearing their stories. I love to, to hear their journey. And every once in a while, God will allow me to speak into their journey. And, and he'll let me help someone with their journey. And that's such a blessing to be able to do that. I want you guys to know, every single one of us in this room, we need someone to counsel us. We need someone to lead us. We need someone's wisdom. And it isn't Jason's wisdom, it's Jesus' wisdom. Can I get a big amen to that? We all have a need of someone to pour out into our story. And Jesus came to do that. One of the beauty, beautiful things about being a Christian is that we have the power of this Holy Spirit that when we are facing a struggle, when we are facing a trial, when a big decision is coming up, we can fall on our knees and God will guide us and lead us if we allow him to. He is the wonderful counselor who will lead our life every step of the way if we'll let him. Not only that, guys, you see here, he's also a mighty God. Not only do we have need of wisdom, guidance, and direction, we have need for power. I don't care how big you are. I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care how impressive your resume is. The truth is, all of us need supernatural power in our life. We can't buy our way out of cancer. We can't success our way out of a broken marriage. We, we, can, we cannot use our looks to fix our children. But the power of God in us can heal every brokenness that we face. Can I get an amen to that? There is nothing that our God cannot do to and through and in us if we will trust him as a mighty God. If you're here and you're visiting with Ignite, I want you to know something about our church. We believe in the supernatural power of God. We believe that that power is present in this age, and we believe that our God has a healing for your brokenness no matter what you're walking through. He is a mighty and powerful and present God. Not only that, guys, he's an everlasting father. I was really blessed. I have a, a great earthly dad. Um, who does a good job uh, loving me, guiding me, and keeping me straight when I need it. But some of you, your story is very, very different. I want you to know, in this room, if you are a child of God, there are no orphans. We all have a Father that loves us, that is with us, and that will move heaven and earth on our behalf. One of the things about Christmas that's interesting is that Christmas magnifies what we're walking through. The good times are better, and the hard times are harder. I want you to know that if this season, as you're looking around at, at the world, as you're checking your social media, if you're feeling alone, understand you are not alone because you have a spiritual daddy that is with you every step of the way, and he loves you and is devoted to you more than you can imagine. And the fact that he's an everlasting father, that means he's never going to write us a will and leave us. He is there with us for all of eternity. And we can always rest in the power of his love. He's an everlasting father. And finally, guys, we see this prince of peace. This is the most wonderful time of the year, but it can be a really stressful time of the year. We're trying to buy all the gifts. We are dealing with all the lines. I mean, gosh, try to go to Bed Bath & Beyond today or, you know, like go in the mall today. Like it's certain places, it's like you, it's, just, it's just chaos. It's absolute chaos. And it can be easy for our peace to be broken by our circumstances. Get on Greenville Boulevard as you get closer and closer to Christmas and you will... Yes. <laughs> Your peace will be challenged, at least if you're me. My peace is challenged this time of year. 
my wife and I have been going through uh, some very small peace challengers the, the past couple of weeks. Um, we, we're, we're, we're two people that we, we want to give good gifts to our kids. We want to give gifts to our friends. We, we've been praying about the gift we bring to Ignite. And the, for the past two weeks, we've had things that have been breaking on us. Last, last, not yesterday, but last Saturday, uh, we were washing some clothes, and we noticed that um, a puddle was forming on the floor uh, of our laundry room. And, of course, being the man that I am, I ripped open the front of our washing machine, took a look at it, and said, I can't fix this. You know, like, there's water, there's electricity. This is not going to end well if I stick my hand in here. I really did pull up in the front, and I accomplished nothing. But, you know, I tried. Um, so we had the $500 for a new washing machine that we weren't. So that's what we got for Christmas. Yeah, what every girl dreams of, washing machine. Yeah. Then, then, then yesterday, my, my, my wife is trying to go to the Tapestry Women's Ministry and notices her car will not crank. $300 a new fuel pump later, and it works. But we did not budget for that. And so just being real with you guys, like, man, my peace has been challenged. I'm so thankful that we have a prince of peace that has nothing to do with our circumstances. It has nothing to do with our bank accounts. It has nothing to do with our office situation. It has nothing to do with what we're walking through. It has to do with him. He is and always will be the giver of peace in our life if we'll allow him to. And we need it. He came to serve us. You know what my problem is, though? A lot of times, instead of receiving Jesus' service, I fight against him as the one who has come to serve me. I talk about my kids a lot, y'all, and so y'all have to forgive me for doing that. But they really do. Like, they, my children teach me what a brat I am sometimes through our Heavenly Father, even though I have very good kids. Um, the twins have been really, really fun. And, and I, I, again, I guess I'm learning so much through them. I don't know if any of you have had babies that are like this, but um, my twins... When we try to change their diaper, they act like we're stabbing them with a knife, okay? I don't know why. I, maybe, like, Gabby and Nathaniel, when it was time, like, we, you know, we smell a little something. or we, we, You can pick up that diaper, ooh, this thing is, like, full. You know, like, you can, you can tell. Like, we'd lay them down, we'd open them up, we'd change them up, boom, boom, and it, it was all good. You know, like, it wasn't a big deal. The twins, both of them do this. You pick them up, and at first they're like, yay, you're picking me up. And then you start to lay, it's like, no! Like, they arch their back, and they get red-faced, and they're kicking their little legs, you know, as, as hard as you can. It's like, man, this, I, like, sometimes I want to talk to them and say, like, this isn't what I want to do right now either, babe. You know, like, you stink. I know, I know that I'm about to reveal something that's going to haunt my dreams tonight when I pull up that. Like, I... I, I'm not excited about this moment either because they act, they act like you're enjoying my pain, Daddy. You know, like they, they act like I betrayed them. No, I'm trying. I'm trying to clean up your mess. I'm trying to clean up your mess. And I love you enough. You don't have to clean up your mess even though you should, you ungrateful little baby. Like, no. You don't have to. I'm your daddy, and it's my job to clean up your mess. Praise Jesus. He cleans up our mess. I want you to know this as of the Lord. You do not have to clean up your own sin mess. You do not have to clean up your own relationship mess. You do not have to clean up your mess. Jesus will clean up your mess if you'll let him. He's the one that cleans us up and leaves our bottoms minty fresh, by the way. Like, <laughs> he's the one that cleans us. But so often, instead of receiving who he is, we kick and we squirm and we fight. We need to understand Emmanuel came to serve us. Number two, guys. Write this down. Emmanuel came to rule mankind. Emmanuel came to rule mankind. It's, a very, it's an interesting dichotomy here. We have this God that is a servant of us. He came to serve us, but he also is the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords, and though he serves us, he will never give up his throne. Can I get an amen to that? He came to lead us in the pathway that we should follow. The problem is we don't like rules very much, and we struggle, and we rebel against who he is in us. Micah 5 talks about the rulership of this baby that's going to come. I want to read it for you. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Epatraha, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one who is a ruler in Israel, whose going forth are from old, from everlasting, and he will stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. So not only do we have a servant Messiah, we have a great, kingly, royal Messiah as well who has a plan, a purpose for your life. And, and I know that's a very pastoral thing to say, but can I just say that to all of you? The God of heaven has a plan 
and a purpose for your life. That's a big, big deal. It's bigger than your bank account. It's bigger than the American dream. It's bigger than what the commercials say. God wants to do something spectacular with your life. And most of the time it involves you blessing, loving, and pouring your life into the lives of others. He has a plan for your life. And if we will just trust his leadership and trust his rule, our life can be something very, very amazing. The, the problems that I have in my life and the problems that most of you have in your life is when we try to take our own leadership of our life. We have a God that wants to lead us, but you know, we want to go our own way and do our own thing. I'll go ahead and admit to you, when I try to do my own thing, I often, often mess it up. And my wife is silently saying, yes, you do, sir. <laughs> Amen. Um, and, that, and then it's true. I, I mess up a lot as a husband. I mess up as a pastor. Um, but there's one time in particular I've never shared with you guys, but it's completely true, that I had the very best of intentions and really messed up a situation. So I thought I'd kind of embarrass myself. And this, this is a true story. Um, a, a couple years ago, a, a movie came out, and I'm a movie guy. And this is one of the, my favorite movies ever made, even though it is not a Christian movie. Okay, so I'm not, I'm not endorsing this movie. I'm not saying you should watch this movie. I'm just saying I love this movie. It's a movie called 300. Anybody ever heard of the movie 300? Okay, a couple of you guys. It's a man movie. A lot of blood. Guts, glory, all that, you know, like, and I, I, I love those movies because those are the men that I want to be and never will be because I'm me. Yeah, yeah so anyway, there's no upset about that. But yeah, before the movie came out, there was a comic book, and me being my nerdy self, I had read the comic book, and I was really excited about the movie coming out. Um, I have a cousin who's quite a bit younger than me. His name is Ben. He lives here in Greenville. And when this movie was kind of coming out, I, I called up my dad and said, hey, dad, this movie's coming out. I've read the comic. It's, it's, it's violent, but it's a real good man movie. We, we should take Ben to go see this movie because um, he, he has an amazing mom named Ellen. She's my aunt, but his, his dad hasn't been able to be a part of his life for most of his life. And so he, the time he has with men is, is more limited. So, so let, let's, let's go take him to this, this man. You know, we can drink soda and pretend to grow facial hair, you know, like, like just have a man moment, you know. And so he's like, okay, that sounds great. So we go pick up Ben. Take him to this movie. The first part, if you've ever seen the movie, the first part of the movie is exactly what the comic book is. You know, glory and, and battle and this is Sparta. You know, uh, you know, so I like, you know, it's awesome. And I'm like, Ben, you like this? He's like, yeah, man, this is awesome. This is good. This is good. And then they added a scene in the movie that wasn't in the comic book. King Leonidas has an extremely intense sex scene with his wife. That wasn't in the comic book. And so, okay, it wasn't in the comic book, okay? So... So we're going to this scene. I, 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 I'm smart enough to know what's coming. And so I'm praying, please fade it to black. Please fade it to black. Please fade it. To, they did not fade it to black. They did not. Three and a half minutes of everything you can imagine going on in the screen. And my, my nephew was just like. <laughs> He's 10 years old. He whispers like, what are, what are they doing? I'm like, nothing, nothing. <laughs> They're doing nothing. It's a sleepover. <laughs> like, <laughs> turn away, child, turn away, you know? Like, and my dad is like, what movie did you bring me to? <laughs> it wasn't in the comic book, okay? So, so we, get, we get through it. We get through it and watch, watch the rest of the movie. And, and um, I go, <laughs> this is not, this is completely true. I'm walking out of the movie theater like, Ben, what did you think about the movie? He's like, oh, it was amazing, especially that scene with it. And I'm like, No! <laughs> No! So um, I had to go to my aunt and knock on the door, and she came to the door. How was the movie? It was great. Have you had the talk with Ben? No, you need to tonight. <laughs> That's what Pastor Jason did. So <laughs> we can have very good intentions with our life. Y'all hear me because I know that, yeah. We can have very good intentions with our life. But if we follow our way instead of his way, the king's way, we are going to mess it up. And some of you, and I speak this as to the Lord because I love you. Some of you, you know the king's way for you. And you're trying to carve out your own path. Trust him as king. And he will never lead you any place that is wrong. You guys might want to write this down somewhere. This, this is something, you know, it's not a blank, but, it, but I think it's good. Jesus never commands us to do anything he doesn't characterize. You get to write command and characterize. Whatever he commands, he always characterizes. So he commands us to be loving, and he is love. He commands us to serve, and he's the servant of all. He commands us to be patient, and he is the one that waited the millennia to sacrifice himself for us. Like Whatever he commands, he characterizes. He leads from the front, not from the rear. And we can trust him and follow him with our life. 
In Matthew 2, we see these wise men that even though they'd never met Christ, they recognized who he was from the beginning. So I'm just going to read a piece of their story. This is Matthew 2, 1 and 2. It says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. And they said, Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. He is a great king that will never, ever, ever lead us astray. Number three, guys, write this down. Emmanuel came to die for mankind. He came to serve us. He came to rule us. But most of all, he came to die for us. Because no matter how greatly he served, his service could not save us. No matter how fairly he ruled, his kingdom could not save us. He had to pay the price for us. And he came knowing that he was going to die. Again, hundreds of years before the Christ child came, Isaiah was speaking of him. And this is what he had to say. I hope the power of this will not be lost on you. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him. And by his stripes we are what, Ignite Church? We're healed. Before I go any farther, I actually, do you really believe that? Do you believe that the Jesus who is willing to die for you has a healing for your life? He has a healing for your addictions. He has a healing for your marriage. He has a healing for your situation. He has a healing for your doubt. He has a healing for you if you will trust in him and believe him. Verse 6 describes how we are, though. It says, all of us like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that's Jesus, the iniquity of us all. That last part always breaks my heart. Like I, I wrestle with even whether to include it, but I think it's important for us to realize that even, even us in this room who love him, who know him, I know we get so distracted, don't we? We get so distracted. I mean, and this time of year, that is so apparent. I mean, I love the lights and love the presents and love all the trappings. I love Santa Claus. Love Santa Claus. As far as I'm concerned, the North Pole is real. Can I get an amen to that? I have four elves on the shelves. Our house is full of elves everywhere. They are like... Love all that, but if we're not careful, that stuff can be a distraction to the true and genuine reason for why we celebrate this time. It's not about the North Pole. It's about heaven meeting earth through Christ. He came to die for us. In the New Testament, there was a a man who is just a really, really incredible biblical character. We don't talk about him nearly enough. It's a, a guy named Simeon. And he was one of the, the prophets and leaders in the church when Jesus was born. And this guy, the, the Bible describes him as someone whose whole heart was devoted to God. There aren't many people in the Bible that are described that way. And when Jesus went into the temple for the very first time as a little baby, his parents brought him in. This man, Simeon, he, he looked at Jesus, and he immediately, by the Holy Spirit, knew who he was. And I just wanted to read for you the words that he spoke over this baby to his mother and to his father. It says, Simeon blessed them, and he said to Mary, his mother, It says, Behold, this child, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword, he's speaking to Mary now, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. For a long time, I I didn't understand this passage. I understand the first part, yes. I just want you to know, I know who your baby is. Your baby, your baby is going to be the rise of so many people in Israel. And there are going to be people in Israel who think that they're righteous, but when they meet Jesus, they're going to realize that they're not righteous. He's already you know, talking about the Pharisees. And, you know. But then he looks at her and says, and I just want you to know a sword is going to pierce your soul because of this baby. I don't think that Mary could have understood the meaning behind that then. But fast forward 33 years, and Mary, the very real mother of Jesus, she is standing at a hill called Golgotha and she's watching her son die and if you have kids I I do I want you to imagine just for a second like like this was a real mom and Jesus was was a real boy God you know what I mean like he and he was beautiful you know that he was beautiful I mean imagine having a child that like never lies to you that always honors you that loves taking showers every night, <laughs> like, that likes broccoli better than cookies. Like, imagine, I don't know who Jesus, how Jesus was, but, like, it, it, the Bible is clear he had no sins. Like, this, this is, like, you can never be any more proud of a, of a child than Mary was of Jesus. 
And then he grows up and becomes one of the greatest things that any child could be. I mean, I don't know what you dream your children will be, but let's just be real. If we're a follower of Christ, like there's no greater thing than anyone than, than bringing heaven and earth together. That's what Jesus did. You know, as, as, a, as a prophet, as a leader. And so you know Mary was so proud of him. He was a miracle worker. The people loved him. And then there she is. It all went so wrong. This, this beautiful baby boy, he's been stripped naked. He's been spat upon. He's been beaten in the face so much so that he didn't look like a man anymore. His back was so laid open with the whip that you could see his organs through his skin. The crown of thorns is upon his head. And everyone is mocking and jeering. Imagine being Mary in that moment. I don't know how she felt, but I know how I would have felt. I would have felt like, God, you got it wrong. If anyone did not deserve to be on the cross, it's this guy. My son, if anyone deserved to not feel pain at him. If anyone deserved to not be an agony, if anyone deserved to be loved, it was him instead of hated. God, you had to have gotten this wrong. But God got it right. Because you know who really should have been on the cross? Me. And you. And he did it for every single one of us. And I promise you, he would do it all again. He would do it all again. He would come down again. He would give up heaven again. He would suffer with us again, and he would bleed and die for us again if that's what it took for you and I to have peace with God. He came to die because only in his death would salvation come. When you came in, I hope you got a communion cup. It looks like this. If you got one, you can pull it out. If you do not have one, um, our ushers are going to be bringing some by in just a moment. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask you to do something. If, if you don't have one at Ignite Church, um, we believe that communion is for every believer. And so we serve what we call an open communion. If you are confident that Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life, we invite you to take communion with us. Now, if you're, if you're uncertain as to where you stand with God, do not take communion. It's something that we do with him. But, but you're invited to be in this moment with us. If you don't have a cup and you'd like to partake of communion, um, you can just raise your hand. And our ushers will bring you one. But keep them up for a little while because they're starting in the back. They're coming forward. So if you need a cup, just raise your hand and they're coming forward to give you. Hold it up high. And if, if you have to be patient, switch arms. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, we thought there would be no more perfect way to celebrate God with us than reminding us our, ourselves as a church that he came to bleed and to die for us. That was the point. On the night before Jesus was betrayed, he... He was with the men he loved most, his disciples. These men that he had spent three years pouring into them, praying with them, doing miracles with them, teaching them. He, he was with them, and, and they were eating together. And I believe that all of them knew that something was different. Jesus had already been telling them, I, I, I'm, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. But I don't think that in that moment the disciples really understood what that meant. You know, we see the end of the story because we have the Bible. They really, I think, believed that Jesus was going to be this, this, this leader on earth. And to help illustrate what was going to happen, Jesus did something unique. As they were eating, he took a piece of bread, and he broke it in their midst. And he gave the pieces to them and said, this is my body. This is my body. It's going to be broken for you. And he said, I want you to take it. And I want you to eat it. And when you do that, I want you to remember me. Because I'm broken on your behalf. If you will, Ignite Church, just peel off this top clear layer. And today as a church, we want to attest that we believe that our brokenness is healed not by our effort, not by our service, not by our generosity, or anything that we can accomplish. Our brokenness is healed because Jesus was willing to be broken on our behalf. If you will now with me, take... After the bread, Jesus took a cup of wine. He held it up in their midst and he blessed it. And he passed it out with them and said, listen, this is my blood. The blood of the new covenant shed for you. You don't understand this now, but I go and I'm going to bleed in your place. And by my blood, you will be forever healed. If you will, Ignite Church, peel back this second layer. 
inside there is grape juice representing the blood of Christ. And in this moment, let's honor him. The newborn babe that came to be with us, that was willing to show us the way and who died in our place. Let's take together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. We do not deserve your love and your grace. We do not deserve that you would leave the perfection of heaven to come and dwell with us in the brokenness of earth. We do not deserve that you would stand in our place. But because of your love, you were willing to pay the price that we never could pay. You shouldn't have had to come and die, Father. You gave us the law and it was so clear, all we had to do was follow it. But we couldn't do it. You raised up the nation of Israel to be a light and a guide to us. But they failed over and over and over again. And even if they had not, the world, we still would have been lost and broken. And as you saw our hurt, as you saw our brokenness, as you saw and witnessed our pain, you were willing to say no to you so you could say yes to us that we may have peace with God forever. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for coming to be with us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, this, that as we remember you and as we honor you, that we would be the hands the feet, the face, and the love of Jesus to a world that is still broken, still dark, and it still needs God with us. You have entrusted your mission to us, and we commit, Father, we will go out and be your love. Help us to do this, we ask in the name of Jesus, and together we say.